Okay, welcome back. Um, we have four talks uh, in this segment. Um, and our first talk, Alberto is going to um, revisit, uh, pre presenting his own study on the long-term results uh, of an internet intervention. And as I said before, um, Alberto is from the University of uh, Zaragoza in mm -hmm. Spain. So I'm gonna sh share my screen, which will be your slide. Okay, far away, okay. Alberto. Thank you, Dr. Mansell. Uh, here I go again. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the long term effects of uh, transdiagnostic uh, ICBT protocol for emotional disorders uh, in public specialized uh, mental health care. Uh, anxiety and depression are the most uh, common anxiety disorders, um, and they are prevalent, costly, and a major cause of disability uh, worldwide. Uh, moreover, the consequences of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic have increased the need for uh, digital uh, interventions. Uh, the literature has shown that the transdiagnostic ICBT is uh, effective. However, current meta-analysis on transdiagnostic ICBT mostly report uh, post-treatment outcome. And uh, this uh, suggests that uh, more research on the long-term effects of transdiagnostic ICBT uh, is needed. Some reasons include the high chronicity and relapse rates uh, among uh, these disorders and the direct and uh, indirect costs associated with uh, these, disorder, these disorders, which are huge. Uh, the objective then is to, was uh, to analyze the long-term outcomes of transdiagnostic ICBT for emotional disorders compared to treatment as usual in public specialized mental health care. The design is, uh, well, we uh, conducted a secondary analysis of a previously uh, published randomized controlled trial. Participants were adults with uh, emotional disorders uh, recruited in public specialized mental health care uh, units. Uh, to participate in the study, uh, they had to be 18 years old or older, fluent in Spanish, have internet and an email account, uh, meet uh, DSM-4 uh, diagnostic criteria for a mood or anxiety disorder, and not suffering from a severe uh, psychiatric disorder or a risk of suicide. Pharmacological uh, treatment, sorry, well, it's not important. It's not important. Um, uh, the outcomes include uh, the mini international uh, interview for the clinical diagnosis, anxiety and depression and depressive uh, symptoms, health-related quality of life, uh, the diagnosis uh, status, and the number of, uh, of diagnosis, the comorbidity. The intervention was a transdiagnostic guided uh, ICBT with, with uh, 12 uh, modules. Uh, the uh, protocol uh, was, uh, is based on the unified uh, protocol skills, and it also includes uh, some uh, treatment strategies from uh, the dialectical behavioral uh, therapy. And the intervention uh, was uh, supported with a one weekly uh, phone call with a maximum duration of uh, 10 minutes with no clinical content. We perform uh, linear uh, mixed models uh, based on the intention to, to treat uh, principles to analyze data. Uh, this is the flow chart of, of participants from baseline to one year uh, follow up. We recruit uh, about uh, 100 participants in uh, each of the groups. Um, and well, as uh, in the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, that we have 46 and 47 uh, patients at one year follow up. Next, please. Uh, this table shows uh, the social demographic and clinical characteristics of the sample. Uh, the mean age was uh, 58 year olds. They were mostly uh, female, married or partnered. The most uh, common diagnoses were generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and agoraphobia and mood disorders. Uh, about half of the sample uh, had uh, more than one uh, diagnosis and uh, about uh, three thirds of the sample were taking uh, some kind of medication. Next, please. Uh, this, is, uh, this shows the uh, results from baseline to one year uh, follow up for the main outcomes. And to keep it uh, brief, uh, the sample sizes uh, range from, uh, from the small to moderate uh, range uh, in all uh, measures in anxiety, in depression, in health-related quality of life, and in uh, comorbidity. Next, please. Next. 
And uh, 46% of patients in treatment as usual versus 22% of patients in front diagnostic ICBT make diagnostic criteria for their baseline uh, principal diagnosis at one year follow up. Next, please. Uh, to finalize the results, uh, support the long term uh, effectiveness of transdiagnostic trans ICBT in public specialized uh, care. And based in these uh, results, we believe that the implementation of ICBT in public specialized mental health care might be uh, key to help face uh, both low, uh, long lasting barriers, such as uh, lack of uh, resources of mental health uh, services or the lack of training among uh, clinicians, and also the emerging difficulties derived from the current uh, COVID 19 pandemic. Last one. Uh, the limitations, main limitations are that attrition was high in both conditions that were the, uh, one year follow up, but uh, these dropout rates in internet uh, interventions are high even at the short term uh, follow ups, and uh, that the sample size was uh, small. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much there, Alberto. That's super. Thanks. Thank you. Really important to to see evidence for long term outcomes because there's mm -hmm. not enough of it collected, and that's it's fabulous to see this this data set emerging. So, thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> um, next um, up, we have uh, Abigail Kay, who's from here at the University of Manchester, and Abigail will be talking about uh, a method of levels process study. Uh, so, Abby, if you'd like to share your screen, um, uh, your talk can. Hi. Um, Hello. Oh, it says I'm disabled from screen sharing. Uh, right, I thought I'd made you co-host, but I'll do it again. It might be because you came out and came back in again. Try again. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Lovely. Okay. Um, so hi, I'm here to talk about um, my study, which was a pilot feasibility study of method of levels and um, targeting goal level awareness. So according to PCT, um, psychological distress is the result of loss of control due to conflicting goals that are often outside of our awareness. And goal conflict is resolved by a process called reorganization um, of the control systems that are creating the conflict. Um, so method of levels is a transdiagnostic cognitive therapy based on PCT and it's proposed that it works by, re by enabling reorganisation through facilitating an in-depth exploration of a problem and shifting awareness to our higher level goals which are the source of goal conflict. So to um, run this study um, as there was no um, self-report measure that assess shifts in awareness, we developed a new questionnaire, which is the goal level awareness questionnaire. So participants were required to record between five to 15 personal goals and rate them in, import, in order of importance to them. Um, and then these, the goal, the top five rated goals were coded based on powers levels of percep perception. So we had uh, number one was given to program level goals. So they're the um, more concrete goals that uh, sort of specify a course of action. And then we have two for principal level goals. And um, so they're sort of the more general rules that might determine a course of action. And then uh, number three is given to a system level goal. So that's more of your moral abstract principles. And um, so the top five goals um, were rated on that coding system and the scores would range then between 5 and 15 and the higher scores would indicate a higher level of goal, goal awareness. So the aim of the study was to determine the feasibility for a future trial. So we looked at the recruitment and retention rates and we also looked to assess the integrated reliability and the construct validity of the GAQ and to assess the post-intervention effect size of the GAQ. So the participants were um, adults, um, English speaking and experiencing symptoms of depression. We recruited 40 participants via online advertisement, um, majority of which were students. Um, so participants were randomly allocated to either the method levels or the brief behavioral activation condition. Um, brief BA was a control condition and we decided that because um, Whereas MOL sort of shifts awareness, well, hypothesized to shift awareness up levels, 
brief BA focuses on sort of the more lower level goals. So it specifies sort of what, what the goal is, when to do it, how to do it. Um, so we thought that that might be a good comparison condition. Um, so participants attended um, one session of talking therapy, which was via Zoom, um, which was a change due to COVID. And they completed questionnaires um, before therapy, after therapy, and we did a seven day follow up and then they attended a follow up therapy session. The main findings um, were that it was feasible to recruit um, a sample of um, we had a minimum of 30 and the retention rate was over 80 percent and that was until follow up. Um, we did find though that the integrated reliability of the GAQ was poor to moderate and the GAQ had weak relationships with the criterion measures um, and they were the behavioural identification form and the awareness of goal conflict scale. We did find that the post-intervention GAQ scores were higher for the MOL group um, in comparison to BA and there was a large estimated effect size but it's important to note the study is underpowered to support conclusions regarding effect. Um, the few limitations was that the researcher was also the therapist, so there was potential for bias. Um, and the raters of the GAQ received different amounts of training. Um, and that was because our first volunteer um, dropped out, so we had to recruit someone last minute. It's possible that cr the criteria measures are measuring different constructs, as there was also a relationship between them. And also the feasibility of delivering MOL by video therapy hasn't yet been established. So going forward, um, before running this as a future trial, we do hope to establish the reliability of the GAQ. And we hope to do that by ensuring the training and experience is sufficient and equivalent between races. We also thought about some revisions to the GAQ, so providing some more information around the goals or adding in some additional questions. And we hope to establish the validity of the GAQ as well. And one way we might do this is to examine the, conver the convergence with the depth and duration and um, depth and duration of awareness coding scheme. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abby. That's super. <laughs> very nicely and clearly explained. Some quite difficult concepts to get across there. Super. Um, so that's super. Thank you, Abby. Our next speaker. Uh, is Valentina Gardini um, and Valentina is from the University of Bologna um, in Italy and she'll be providing a systematic review of virtual reality therapy. Uh, so Valentina, um, yeah. are you able to, super hello, hi there, hi again, are you able to share yeah. your screen with us? Yeah, I should, okay, can you see it? Yes, yes we have it. Okay, perfect. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Valentina Gavini and I'm a PhD student at the Department of Psychology of University of Bologna in Italy. My main field of research is virtual reality and uh, today I'm here to present to you the results of the systematic review of the literature um, regarding the effects of virtual reality in targeting transdiagnostic factors for mental health. Um, with the term virtual reality, we usually refer to an array of technologies that allow individuals to experience and interact with computer-generated 3D um, environments through an ad-mounted display. Um, virtual reality is able to create a nice sense of presence and reality that usually uh, produces emotional responses that are similar to the ones that individuals experience in everyday life. Uh, given this and also the ability of virtual reality to provide a controlled and personalized uh, experience, uh, virtual reality has been used also in clinical psychology as a form of exposure therapy. And uh, some authors also uh, suggested its use to visually challenge maladaptive assumptions for people that, for example, struggle with imaginative techniques. Um, indeed, some systematic reviews uh, tell us that uh, virtual reality is effective in uh, reducing symptomatology and also in improving uh, CBT protocols for several psychopathologies such as anxiety disorders, psychosis, eating disorders, and substance-related disorders. Um, however, to date, the VR interventions and software that have been developed have mainly focused on a disorder-specific approach with only a few exceptions. This means that 
there is a need for multiple different software tackling different specific disorders, which of course create a very uh, important problem, which is the one of uh, high costs, both in terms of training and the, of equipment, which uh, in general uh, limits the applicability of these technologies in the clinical field. One way to overcome this problem is to apply the transgenostic approach to virtual reality. And of course, the transgenostic approach has already found support in clinical psychology for its ability to create protocols that target transgenostic factors that are shared by multiple diagnoses, and that because of this can be applied to multiple disorders. Um, of course, applying the transgenostic approach to virtual reality would help uh, uh, to create a VR software and a VR protocol that could be used on several psychological disorders at once. Um, because of this, the aim of this review was to collect the available studies about the effects of virtual reality interventions on transagnostic factors that are targeted by CBT-based approaches in order to um, understand on which virtual reality can be um, helpful and which one could be uh, possibly included in a VR transagnostic software. Uh, for our review, we followed a Prisma methodology. And we started by searching three databases, which are PsycheInfo, PsychArticles, and PubMed. Regarding keywords, we tried to um, include CBT-based transgenostic factors. And in the literature, we could not find a list of set transgenostic factors that are shared by the literature. However, we tried to include both the factors um, um, that are uh, related to internalizing disorders, as well as factors that are related to externalizing disorders. And also we try to include uh, factors that are targeted by traditional CBT, such as reappraisal, and factors that are targeted instead by more novel third wave CBT approaches, such as psychological flexibility. And our final list was uh, composed by emotion regulation, reappraisal, avoidance, impulsivity, aggression, disinhibition, and as I said, psychological flexibility. And they were combined, of course, with the term virtual reality or VR. Inclusion criteria for the studies that we selected were um, peer-reviewed studies and case reports published on academic journals, written in English or in Italian, evaluating changes in transgenostic factors following the application of a VR intervention, and that were published between 2010 and March 2021. Um, regarding the results, after uh, removing duplicates, a total of 740 articles were retrieved. And after screening of abstracts and full text, we selected a total of 44 peer reviewed studies and six uh, case reports. Um, regarding the prevalence of each transgenostic factors, um, avoidance was the most studied transgenostic factor with uh, 28 uh, articles followed by emotional regulation, which was in, instead included in 10 articles. Unfortunately, for impulsivity, aggression, and cognitive appraisal, we were able to find only very few studies. And instead, no study emerged for disinhibition or psychological flexibility. Regarding the populations on which the studies that we selected were carried out on, um, the main group was um, that of anxiety-related disorders patients, which is, of course, uh, not surprising, considering the fact that the very first uh, um, virtual reality softwares were developed to tackle phobias or anxiety-related disorders. Uh, the second group was that of general population adults, and we also uh, found some studies regarding PTSD, uh, psychosis, substance-related disorders, eating disorders, OCD, and personality disorders. However, these were very much understudied population compared to the others. Um, regarding methodology of the studies that we selected, only very few studies included follow-ups, and in particular, eight studies for avoidance, three for emotion regulation, one for impulsivity, and two for aggression. And, and regarding uh, the presence of a control group, only um, control group were included only in 11 studies for avoidance, six for emotional regulation, and one for aggression. In particular, when looking at the control studies, there were very few randomized controlled trials, which were only eight for avoidance and one for aggression. And um, instead, VR was compared uh, usually to a waiting list or an inactive group that did not under undergo any intervention, or uh, they tried to test the combination between VR and CBT or between, or between VR and another kind of intervention, 
uh, versus the effects produced by yeah, CBT only or another intervention only uh, group. Or um, they try to compare the application of a VR only intervention versus other kinds of interventions. Um, as I said, avoidance was the most studied um, transdiagnostic factor, which was found in 28 out of the 50 articles that we found. Um, more, more in particular, 22 out of these uh, articles regarded behavioral avoidance. But uh, some articles also included other kinds of avoidance, such as social avoidance, experiential avoidance, food-related avoidance, alcohol approach avoidance, and cognitive avoidance. Uh, speaking of the results regarding behavioral avoidance, um, VR was found effective in reducing these transdiagnostic factors, both in the general population and in patients with anxiety-related disorders, with the results often maintained over time at one, three, six, and 12 months follow-up. Um, also, uh, VR achieved better results than traditional techniques, and also uh, VR groups achieved um, better results than waiting lists or inactive groups. Uh, and when used in addition to CBT, VR also achieved better results than groups using um, only CBT. Um, finally, uh, VR exposure was often considered more acceptable than in vivo exposure by patients. Uh, regarding the other kinds of avoidance, the results were promising with VR being able to uh, reduce these um, kinds of avoidance. However, mixed results were found for social avoidance because only one out of the two studies um, that were conducted on patients with psychosis um, reported a reduction of social avoidance. Of course, however, uh, further research is needed because only a few studies were available, were available for these um, transdiagnostic factors and kind of, support, of avoidance. Um, emotion regulation, as I said, was that the second most studied factor with the found in 10 out of the 50 articles. Um, VR was generally effective in the general population for improving emotional regulation strategies, for inducing relaxation, and for reducing distressing emotions and emotional responses to stressors. And these uh, studies, uh, these results were also maintained at a follow up of three and six months in the three studies that included a follow up. Instead, when compared to a waiting list or an active group or to more, to more traditional techniques, such as the use of role plays, uh, VR also achieved better results than these groups. Um, and when used in combination with traditional interventions, such as cognitive bias modification of interpretations or mindfulness-based interventions, uh, virtual reality also achieved better results than groups uh, uh, using only traditional interventions only. However, um, only three studies included control groups that did not undergo non-VR interventions, so these results are, uh, need further research to be confirmed. Regarding the uh, less studied transdiagnostic factors that we included, um, impulsivity was found in three out of the 50 articles that we selected. And in one case report, VR was uh, um, helpful in reducing impulsive and compulsive behaviors in three patients with OCD. In one study, VR was also able to reduce impulsivity in patients with aggressive behaviors that followed uh, transdiagnostic application of a VR aggression prevention training. And also in one study, impulsivity was not directly assessed, but uh, they showed potential for VR to reduce uh, impulsive behaviors and craving in adolescents with the uh, internet gaming disorders. Regarding aggression, the same study that applied a transdiagnostic application of virtual reality aggression prevention training in inpatients with aggressive behaviors also measured aggression, but did not report any improvement in this transdiagnostic factor. Uh, another study instead showed that VR was successful in reducing aggression at driving in eight uh, veterans that underwent um, VR driving exposure in combination with CBT. And results in this case were also maintained at one month follow up. Uh, finally, reprisal was, also, was only included in one case report that showed, however, that avatar based VR therapy uh, combined with the CBT was helpful in inducing cognitive appraisal through perspective taking in uh, two children that presented with depressive, anxious, and PTSD-related symptomatology. 
To summarize our results, we can say that, of course, behavioral avoidance was the most studied transdiagnostic factor. Um, this is, however, not surprising uh, because, as I said, the very first softwares that were developed um, were, of course, for the treatment of phobias and used as a form of exposure and extinction. Um, VR was also capable of improving emotional regulation and behavioral avoidance in the general population and in patients with anxiety, and results were maintained over time. However, given the fact that only three uh, studies involved a follow-up for emotional regulation, um, results for this uh, transgenostic factor need further research to be confirmed. Um, also, VR was also more effective than waiting lists or inactive groups, uh, both for emotional regulation and behavioral avoidance. And also when used in combination with traditional intervention, uh, virtual reality achieved better results uh, for emotional regulation and behavioral avoidance than um, groups using traditional interventions only. Um, promising results were found for impulsivity, aggression, cognitive appraisal, and other kinds of avoidance, but of course more research is needed because studies were um, very few. Um, also, while transdiagnostic VR software have been developed to improve emotional regulation and aggression, um, we were not able to find any software that was designed to tackle multiple transdiagnostic factors at once or a uh, software that tackle the third wave CBT-based factors such as uh, experiential avoidance directly or psychological flexibility. Um, as I said, future research is needed. For example, um, studies should focus on uh, the application of VR in trans on transdiagnostic factors for other clinical populations, such as on patients for eating disorders, psychosis, substance-related disorders, personality disorders, and so on. Uh, studies should also use larger sample sizes because only 18 out of the 50 studies that we selected had a sample size larger than 50 participants. Also, uh, follow-ups should be included in more studies, especially um, for emotional regulation, impulsivity, aggression, cognitive appraisal, and other kinds of avoidance. Similarly, uh, more uh, randomized controlled trials and dismantling studies are needed in order to truly understand the impact of virtual reality. And finally, uh, it will be interesting to see more studies um, on the application of virtual reality on third wave CBT factors such as psychological flexibility and experiential avoidance. Of course, these results need to be seen in light of the limitations that were, of course, present in the, in the um, distribu. Uh, for example, using only three databases and um, limited lists of keywords might have excluded studies regarding other important diagnostic factors. And this was also due to, the, to our inability to find a shared list of diagnostic factors in the literature. Uh, also, while, pub while selecting pub um, articles that were published only in the last 10 years uh, allowed us to consider only recent and advanced VR software, uh, this might have excluded relevant articles that were instead published in the early stages of VR research. And finally, as I said, limited sample sizes uh, of the found studies um, limits the generability of the results. Uh, in conclusion, improving research on uh, the application of VR and transdiagnostic software on transdiagnostic factors and the creation of a transdiagnostic VR software would definitely help to improve costs and efficiency of VR interventions, which are the main limits of this technology, especially in the clinical field, and to broaden uh, their applicability. Also, considering the similarities between VR and technologies that we use in everyday life, an effective VR software would help uh, reducing the stigma that is often present uh, towards psychotherapy and also to reach uh, reluctant individuals uh, such as for example people um, young people which are of course uh, more interested in um, uh, technology in general and finally a VR software that is able to tackle multiple transgenostic factors would help to prevent several mental health disorders thank you Thank you very much, Valentina. That's superb.
Oh, right. Oh. It's it's um it's impressive how contemporary all the uh, or many of the studies were that you've assessed and how comprehensively yeah. you've you've surveyed the transdiagnostic processes. So well done for that and all the very relevant implications that you've uh, synthesized for us. So thanks very much. Thank you. Um, now we have a, f a final talk um, for, the, for this evening, but it's not the end of the day because we, we've got a discussion uh, shortly after a break. Um, and it's answering one of those questions that we always want to know the answer to, how do transdiagnostic interventions fare up with disorder-focused approach? Um, and so it's Nina Reinholt from our uh, fourth European country of the afternoon, based at Copenhagen University Hospital in Denmark. So if you want to take it away, you're sharing your screen, Nina. Thank you. Can you see it? Yeah. Good. Um, I think I'm uh, having a rock band uh, practicing downstairs, so I hope you can hear what I say. <laughs> they might give a, I don't know, uh, yeah, they will play at some point. Well, I'm a, a clinical psychologist and specialist in uh, and supervisor in CBT, and I'm also a PhD and senior researcher at the Research Unit for Psychotherapy and Psychopathology at the Mental Health Services in Regen Zealand in Denmark. And I will present the main results from the tract RCT trial, which was part of my PhD where we investigated the relative effects of a transdiagnostic group intervention compared to standard CBT. In Denmark, uh, patients with anxiety and depression can receive free treatment in- Sorry, Nina, are you okay to put yourself on a uh, slide display rather than Sorry, looking yes, at- Sorry, I think I've done that. Sorry. Yes, thank you. That's yes. better. Yeah, in Denmark, patients can receive free treatment and outpatient mental health services. And these services provide group-based standardized treatment programs for anxiety and depression to the most severely affected patients. Patients are reserved to these services when they have not profited from treatment in the primary services. And follow the national clinical guidelines, uh, evidence-based CPT for specific disorders is the recommended treatment in these programs. However, providing a diagnosis-specific interventions in these settings is challenging due to the high rates of comorbidity within these patients. And also, even in large clinics, patients often have to wait a long time to, uh, to enter a group because they have to wait for enough patients with the same diagnosis to start a group. The Unified Protocol for Transdiagnostic Treatment of Emotional Disorders is specifically developed to overcome some of these clinical problems. This emotion-focused CBT intervention is designed to apply across anxiety, depression, and related emotional disorders. Five core modules target patients' levels of neuroticism and dysregulated emotions, since these are considered the main psychopathological processes underlying the emotional disorders. When using this focus, the primary and comorbid disorders could be treated at the same time, which saves costs for otherwise sequential treatments. And patients do not have to wait for enough patients with the same diagnosis to start a group, and hence waiting time uh, for patients could be reduced. The unified protocol is an evidence-based treatment for individual treatment of anxiety disorders. And also open trials, including our own pilot study, suggest that the UP can be adapted to groups and also for patients with depression. However, these are preliminary results and they uh, need adequate testing. And therefore, we tested a newly developed Danish group version of the unified protocol for anxiety and depression in the TRAC RCT trial running from 2016 to 19. The main results have just been published this summer in psychotherapy and psychosomatics. The study was the first randomized control trial comparing the unified protocol with CBT groups for depression and anxiety in mental health services. Due to the potential benefits of the unified protocol, we designed the study as a non-inferiority trial which means that we hypothesized that the unified protocol would not be less effective, that is non-inferior, 
than CBT groups for anxiety and depression in terms of well being and symptoms at the end of treatment. We recruited adult patients with primary depression or anxiety for, from three outpatient mental health services across the country. Inclusion followed the general criteria for participating in treatments in the clinics. Uh, 57 study therapists delivered the treatment and 13 of them were trained in the unified protocol. We randomly allocated patients in a one-to-one -one ratio to either the unified protocol or diagnosis-specific CBT, and outcome assessment and statistical analysis were performed blinded to the treatment allocation. Patients received 14 group sessions uh, in either mixed anxiety and depression groups using the unified protocol or in single diagnosis uh, CBT groups for depression or social phobia or panic disorder and agoraphobia, respectively. The primary outcome was well-being, measured with the WHO-5 at the end of treatment, and we set the non-inferiority margin at nine WHO-5 points, which would not imply a clinical and meaningful difference between the two treatments. Secondary outcomes uh, included functioning and general anxiety and depression symptoms, and also we explored diagnosis specific outcomes and client satisfaction. Assessments were done at baseline end of treatment and a six month follow up. And for the primary outcome, we also followed patients from session to session. The statistical analysis plan followed a pre-planned statistical analysis plan. We increased the sample size from 248 to 320 patients based on high attrition within the first year of intervention. We analyzed the primary outcome at end of treatment for patients who completed treatment using a mixed linear regression model. We tested the robustness of the results in a number of sensitivity analysis, including analyzing all the patients included in the trial. We also ran a number of subgroup analysis to evaluate the uniformity of results. And these are the main results. We included 291 patients in the study and they were allocated almost 50-50 to either unified protocol or CPT groups. In total, we ran the, uh, sorry, 70 therapy groups throughout the trial. One third of the patients did not complete treatment, but there were no differences between the groups in the rates and reason for dropouts, which indicate that the patient tolerated both treatment equally well. 191 patients completed treatment by attending eight or more sessions and were included in the statistical analysis. At baseline, patients' characteristic and outcomes were similar across conditions. Half of the patients had depression and half of the patient had an anxiety disorder. Half of the patients had comorbid diagnosis and half of the patients had previous episodes with the primary, uh, with the primary diagnosis. One third of the patients were working or studying and most patients had uh, previous therapy attempts. Looking at the baseline scores, they indicated that patients had only moderate symptoms, but severely reduced well-being and functioning scores. So this is a rather complex sample, not necessarily in terms of symptoms, but in terms of failed treatment and reduced well-being and functioning. And now for the main result. Looking at the scores at end of treatment, we found a non-significant mean difference of three points favoring CPT at end of treatment. And as you can see from the yellow line in the figure, the result was within the non-inferiority limit, which means that this difference was not clinically relevant either. So as expected, we found that the unified protocol was not less effective than CPT in improving well-being for patients at end of treatment. And five of seven sensitivity analysis confirmed the results, including running the analysis for all patients included in the study. And that makes us pretty confident in this result. And further, there were no differences in outcome between diagnosis, which means that patients with depression profited as much 
as patients uh, with anxiety. Looking at other outcomes, we found no differences between the two. Uh, sorry, we found no differences between the two treatments either. The proportions of patients who remitted from their diagnosis were similar in the two conditions. Half of the patients no more longer make criteria for the primary diagnosis after treatment, and 40% of patients no longer make criteria for the primary and comorb comorbid diagnosis after treatment. The latter is a bit surprising because we would expect the unified protocol to be better than CBT in reducing comorbidity, but that was not what we found in this study. An average patient experienced clinically relevant moderate treatment outcomes, uh, or sorry, treatment effects on most outcomes in both groups at end of treatment. However, the average patient experienced persisting, persisting symptoms and reduced well-being and functioning problems after treatment. Looking at the results for the six-month follow-up, the results were inconclusive. Patients in the unified protocol maintained their treatment gains, whereas patients in CBT improved their well-being scores after treatment. This resulted in a statistically significant mean difference of six points favoring CBT. But as you can see in the figure, the result includes the non-inferiority limit, which means that we cannot conclude that the unified pro protocol is also clinically less effective than CBT. Or said in another way, we know there is a difference at end of at six months follow-up, but we don't know if this is a clinically meaningful difference. And this result was contrasted by non-inferior results on all the other outcomes. And further, we were not powered for this analysis, so we are pretty uncertain about this result and how to interpret it. Looking at the results in context of Existing literature, we found that remission rates around 60% compare well with CBT meta-analysis. However, the overall treatment effect, uh, effects uh, in both groups are modest comparing to studies establishing evidence for the interventions. And we might expect this for this rather complex treatment non-responder sample. Considering the strength of the study, this is a large and robust study, and the inclusion of depression adds to the sparse evidence for unified protocol in this population. Further, the mental health uh, setting and broad inclusion criteria adds external validity to the trial. To highlight some of the limitations of the study, we were not able to include a no treatment control group, which is recommended uh, whenever possible in non inferiority trials. However, we use the golden standard comparator, which adds some sensitivity to the trial. Further, we were only powered for the primary outcome only, which limit the validity of analysis of other outcomes and the follow-up data. In conclusion, our study is the first randomized controlled trial to demonstrate that the unified protocol was not less effective than CBT groups in improving well-being and symptoms at end of treatment for patients with anxiety and depression in mental health services. If the study are replicated, you, the unified protocol groups should be considered a viable alternative to CBT groups in this setting, especially in small clinics where it's not possible to run the diagnosis specific groups or even in large clinics where they are facing long waiting lists or highly comorbid cases. However, the follow-up results were inconclusive and need further testing. And we also need to improve the outcomes for these severely affected patients. So thank you to all the involved in the project and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nina. Superb. You have a, you have a very clear and succinct <coughs> style of presentation. I really feel like I understood your study very clearly and you've given yourself over five minutes of extra time. I'm not sure whether that is intentional or not, but it does give you the opportunity to answer questions. So if you want to stop sharing your screen, mm -hmm. uh, we have that opportunity now. So uh, people could either use, um, could either raise their hand using the reactions tab um, or um, 
use the uh, chat for it. Um, I can see Tim is is back with us again on the edge of his seat. So it might be that Tim wants to uh, ask something. Yes, he does. Super. Go for it. Right, if no one else will. I might have missed this, Nina, but can you say a bit about how you selected the non-inferiority margins and what your thinking was behind them? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was primarily based on conversations with uh, Per Beck, who has developed the, the WHO5 uh, measure. And uh, the non-inferiority margin of nine points uh, would not imply a clinical and meaningful clinical and meaningful difference because uh, you would have to have a difference on 10 points on the scale before it's considered a, a clinically relevant uh, uh, difference. So that was the, the primary reason for choosing nine points. So we would be sure that that, that would not imply a clinical and meaningful difference. And did you think about the margin between a hypothetical, say, wait list or control intervention as well at the other the other side of the UP. Yeah, we we didn't uh, include a, a, um, a no control uh, control group in our trial because we couldn't get the permission of ethical reasons because the CBT is an evidence based treatment, um, and we so. So we think we, we used a comparator, which we know the effects of. Um, but of course, we cannot uh, say if we had a no uh, intervention uh, control group, if that would be placebo uh, uh, effects that we are finding this study. But using CBT as a comparator, where we are pretty confident that it's an effectful uh, treatment, makes us more sure about uh, both uh, those treatment were effective and they also reached a clinical and meaningful difference on all outcomes. So, yeah, but we don't know what, what would have, uh, uh, what would have happened if you had uh, another control group. Thanks, Nina. Um, does anyone else have a brief question for Nina? I have a comment and a question. Um, your results are very similar to ones that we got for our take control course, transdiagnostic group intervention, did a non-inferiority trial compared to low intensity CBT and mm -hmm. found that post-treatment that it was definitively non-inferior. And then at six months, it was unclear because of the kind of margins that you had as, had there. But when I see these trials, I'm constantly reminded that when we develop a transdiagnostic approach, we're not trying to make the effect sizes bigger. We are trying to make the whole science and the implementation of helping people in, in distress so much simpler and cheaper, I, I dare say, or more economic. So do you have any plans to, to try and evaluate how much more efficient in terms of yeah. training and diagnostic screening, et cetera, uh, the yeah. transdiagnostic approaches. Yeah. yeah, we tried to have funding for some economic uh, analysis too, but but we couldn't uh, we couldn't get them. But a longer follow up and economic uh, analysis, uh, and also uh, the premise of waiting time uh, for groups uh, that would be have mm. that would have been nice to to include in the study. Mm. Well, I do hope that you get the funding for that in the future. Mm -hmm. I think it's necessary because there are very few studies on the economic uh, gains of using a transdiagnostic intervention and that mm -hmm. is what we're saying all the time that it's cheaper and more efficient so mm -hmm. I think we need to to measure these things in future trials. And I think part of the economic gains are potentially in the training but it's really hard to kind of factor in the I know three to five years of CBT or clinical psychology training that people have that's diagnostic based that could be made so much more efficient if it was transdiagnostic potentially. Mm -hmm. But I've never seen any attempt to try and factor that economics into it. Have you, have you Tim, seen any uh, attempts to do that? No. <laughs> no, no. No, no, not at all. No. I guess we don't, 
I guess you really only do fully worked up health economics for definitive trials. Yes, so you have to get and to so that point already, don't not you? There's so many of those around. In this arena anyway. Yeah. Um, like like the, if you apply to funders in the UK, like um, the MRC, they, they won't let you put health economics in for anything below a definitive trial level. Mm. They say it's mm. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Well, we have got a, a 10 minute break now. Um, and it's time for us to kind of stretch our legs and return in 10 minutes for some discussion. I'm sure it will just be the ardent few that uh, keep it up at this time, uh, where we're going to actually focus in and review today's talks to actually come to some kind of, uh, I don't know, synthesis around what transdiagnostic processes we need to focus on and, and how to study them. Um, so I'm going to sign off for a sec. Uh, you're welcome to have a chat until we come back in, in, a, few, in a few minutes. <laughs>